Um, we need a new rule for differentiating things when they're products. And let me explain to you why. At the moment when we think about limits, for example, uh, not just limits, but derivatives in general, if I ask you to differentiate not just one power of x, but like a pair of them, okay? So for instance, you don't have to write this, just think about it with me. If I ask you to differentiate this, this is not a rhetorical question, can you differentiate this for me? What happens to this guy? What's that going to turn into? Yep, the 2's going to come out the front, combines with the 5, so you get 10. The power of x reduces by 1, which becomes 1. So 10x, good. What about the other term? Minus 3x squared. Are you happy with that? Does that look OK? And sure enough, if you went and graphed 5x squared minus x cubed and then tried to expect the gradient at each point, you would see that this would give you a, um, uh, uh, an accurate description of what the gradient is all the time. So far, so good. However, you've made a very significant assumption in doing that. The assumption you've made is that you can just differentiate one piece at a time, right? And then just combine them together in the way that they were before. But this ends up being a problem if you try it with products. Underneath this heading, write this this time. Consider this. Now, I'm deliberately choosing an example that you know what the answer is already to, right? You can see what the derivative of this should be based on rules that you already know, but I want to consider what happens if you think about it using the same technique that we just developed over here, right? When you differentiated this, this is a difference, right? Something take away something else, it's a difference. A way you could say it is the derivative of a difference is the difference of the two derivatives. You just differentiated them one at a time, and then you just slapped a minus sign between because that's what was there before. Well, let's have a go at this and see what happens. What's the derivative of x? Not a rhetorical question, it's just one. What's the derivative of this? Also one. And then the original things were a product, so can we say that there's a product in between there? Now, the reason why I point this out, like I said, is because you know what the answer is. If you were differentiating x squared, what should the answer be? It should be 2x because we would follow this, right? So this is clearly not going to work for us. It's not true, right? It doesn't equal 1. It should be equal to 2x. So how do we show that when you're dealing with a product, you can't just simply differentiate each of the, each of the parts of the product and then go ahead as usual, okay? So here's what I want you to do. Um, define y, which is a function of x. I'm just trying to make it really clear by using the function notation. Let's define it as a product of two other functions, right? u and v, each of which are also functions of x, okay? So I'm using function notation here. I don't mean u times x, v times x. I mean u is a function of x, v is a function of x, okay? So in other words, I'm just going to write this, y equals u times v. Now, what I'm about to show you is kind of an informal proof. Um, it's, it's not super ultra rigorous like a, a proper university level mathematician or a, you know, an actual professional mathematician would like, but it will get across to you the essence of what's going on and why this in fact doesn't work. It's something more complicated. Okay? Remember, we suggested that dy and dx are just shorthand. They just mean change a little bit in y, change a little bit in x. That's all they mean. Right? So here I want you to come over here and imagine, what if we added on a little change in y? Right? If we had y and then we added on a little change. Okay? If you've added on a little change to y, and y, remember, is made up of u and v, right? which have been multiplied, then it stands to reason that over here on the right hand side, there ought to be a little change in u as well. Not to mention a little change in v. Let me say that again, because this is sort of a weird idea. It looks weird, right? What I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, well, y is equal to uv. Y is made up of these two functions. What if we just added a tiny little bit of a change 
a small value that's gone up or gone down, if you do it for y, then that means you should do it for u and v as well, because u and v are sort of like the components of y, as it were. It would be a little bit like me saying, OK, um, hey everyone, our class average has gone up by 1. Your number plus a little bit. Well, what that means is every one of the little components, each of you, would also have gone up a little bit. You, you'd each have gone up by 1, basically. Okay? So that's all this line is saying. A little change over here should result in little changes over there. Is that okay? So far, so good? All right, let's see what happens if we just expand this out. Look, the right-hand side looks like something we can expand, right? So I'll just leave this on the left-hand side. It hasn't changed. What is the right-hand side going to become? These are just, just terms here, right? You can do you know, that thing with your hands that you always do. You, you pair your terms up, okay? U times V is just UV. U times DV, that's not a very good V, sorry. U times DV, I'll just write as U D V. Uh, DU times V would be V DU, like so. And then the last pair will be this pair. DU DV. Okay. Now again, that looks a little bit weird. We're not used to throwing around uh, these things, by the way, they have a name. They're called infinitesimals because they're just a little change. Tiny, tiny little thing. Okay? But the, the maths carries out. These are things that can be operated on just like everything else. Now have a look at the left and right hand sides. Do you notice you've got a y here and you've got a uv over here, which we defined right up here is equal to the same thing. Do you agree with that? So therefore, these two terms, they really cancel. They're both the same thing on both sides. So therefore, I can just write this. dy is equal to this. OK, so far so good. OK, now one last step. What am I trying to find? Well, I'm after a derivative, aren't I? Um, I want the derivative of y with respect to what? x, because that's the variable that all of these are functions of. Okay? So therefore, down here, I don't want dy. I want dy on dx. So therefore, it stands to reason I should just divide everything through by dx. That would get me to the derivative. right? So let's go ahead and do that. Divide this, divide this, divide this, divide this. OK. There's one last thing to do. Uh, remember, <coughs> as according to this plot here, right? a derivative is about what happens when that tiny difference, all of these tiny differences, dy, du, dv, when they all approach 0. Right? Do you agree with that? That's, that's what makes these derivatives, the gradient at a point, not just the gradient sort of in general, like on average. Okay? So therefore, if all these differences are going towards 0, do you agree that these are small, these two here are small, but they're sort of compared one to another. So this is just a ray. These two are also small. These two are also small. But look at this guy. Hmm. Hmm. Do you remember I was considering things like this when we were talking about horizontal asymptotes way back when we were graphing, right? If I said to you something like the limit as x approaches infinity of something like x minus 1 over x squared plus 3. This is just an example, right? What's going to happen to this thing? As x gets huge, as x gets enormous, what happens to the top? X is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So what happens to the top? It's also going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? But do you notice the bottom is getting bigger and bigger much faster? Do you agree, right? So therefore, no matter how big the numerator gets, the denominator will always be bigger. So if the denominator is always bigger and it's it's a lot bigger, then what will the limit of this thing approach? It's going to approach 0, isn't it? It's going to approach 0. OK, now have a think about that over here. Think about that same principle, but kind of in reverse. OK? All these things are getting small. They're all getting small, right? But look at this guy, right? Look at the one at the top. 
Do you notice it's two things that are getting small together and they're being multiplied, right? So a small thing times another small thing is going to be an itty bitty tiny thing, right? Does that make sense? It's like you've got both of them getting small at the same time and you're, you're multiplying them, right? So it's almost as though just like this guy, the size is exaggerated. Does that make sense? So even though one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine things, they're all getting smaller, this one gets smaller differently. This one is going to vanish off to zero, okay? Just like that is going to vanish off to zero, okay? So off on the side here, you want to write with me, but the limit as x approaches zero of this particular thing, this particular one, more than the others, as x approaches zero, this thing is going to approach zero, okay? And the principle is because, um, yeah, everything is getting small, but look, these guys are always going to get smaller faster than this guy. So the whole thing vanishes away. So that's pretty much it. What you've got left over this side is what we call the product rule. Um, this, in fact, is the way it's written on the reference sheet. But it's a bit of a mess written like that. This is one of the only times when I actually prefer this dash notation. I've told you before I don't like it because it's easy to get wrong and all that kind of thing. But it does make this next line a lot easier to write. dy on dx is equal to. Now I'm going to swap these two terms around, OK? Um, just to make it a little bit easier to say. v times du on dx, I'm going to write that using my dash notation as u dash. See that? That's v u dash. What's this? Well, this is u times v dash. My year 11 maths teacher said to me, oh, that's just called a vuv. And it just sounds weird, but it's very raw, and it's hard to forget once you've heard someone call it a vuv. Um, this is the product rule. This is the real product rule. You can't just simply differentiate each piece and then say, oh, look, I've got a number out, and you multiply those. That doesn't work. 